this song from 1973 that the anarchos tended to sing, and it goes something like this. The people's flag is red and black, you could stuff your Union Jack. The only way for you and me, the only way is anarchy. We'll hold the burning joint on high, beneath the smoke we'll live or die. We're out of work and on the dole. Just stuff your red flag up your old. <laughs> Sorry, comrades, but the voice isn't too strong today. Please, no, I'm an old geezer. So, more relaxed now. Did that relax you? you didn't get any sectarian <laughs> things going there. <laughs> oh, Putting down the red flag. Right, oh, well. uh, last call for taking your seats. <laughs> that these seats are free in the end. <laughs> Yeah. That one's a bit dodgy. Oh, that one's good. There's another one in the middle row. So the whole thing yeah, we can do it. What? Yeah, it's a good Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it my name is Di Parkin and I'm from the Bristol Radical History Group uh, and I my campaign as a chairing of these two workshops is of having known both people uh, in the 1970s quite separately and I re-met Mac uh, about two years, two years ago in France. We were in this cafe in France amongst a group of friends and he's wearing this badge with Emma Goldman. Uh, on and I said, oh, why are you wearing Emma Goldman badge? And we got talking. Here it is. And, and we said that we had both been active in revolutionary politics back in the 70s and discovered that it was actually in the same town or same part of Kent. And I'd given out leaflets, which he'd probably written, Sorry, outside the railway workshop where he was working. We hadn't seen each other for 45 years. And then as we got talking, uh, he talked about this history of involvement in militant spotting in this town where I was then living. So I said, you must come and talk. So here he is, hot foot from the Pyrenees, Matt. Lucky are me. <laughs> so, thank you. Thanks, guys, very much. Um, yeah, I just wanted to start with a very brief personal history, uh, put things in context, and also go on to very quickly far past forward, as I would say, to the period starting roughly 1971 in Bristol. Um, I was born in 1945, and prior to that, I don't have PowerPoint to show you the bomber, but um, the Luftwaffe Demolition Company under the CEO uh, Fatty Goering, I think his name was, had managed to destroy about 460,000 buildings all over the UK. And, and a lot of people with it, which was actually very good for like property development, if you think about it. I mean, it's free demolition, but I won't go there. But of course, a lot of people were homeless, including my family. Um, my, my mother and father have been demolished. Um, services no longer required, because that was their job, being in the Air Force at the time. And so we were quite in dire straits. My father was unemployed, so we didn't have a lot of money. So, like many thousands of people around the country, approximately, at its highest, 39 to 40,000 people all over the UK, organized individually in groups to take over this used prisoner of war camps and army army camps, and that's what we did. Um, we squatted in a place called Melton Common in Oxfordshire, which was a Italian prisoner of war camp. And so you imagine here as a picture here, we squatted in 
Nissen hats. They were very basic, metal, round, no insulation, very cold in the winter and very hot in the summer. And my earliest memories, and you have to forgive me because I cannot think straight since I gave up taking illegal drugs, but I'll try and, <laughs> try and remember, is of flooding. Um, you know, it's just really rough. But we did have a good time because we could play around in the countryside as kids, you know. And luckily, my dad got a, a, a job in Morris Motors, which was a big manufacturing company of cars at that time in the Oxford area. And so things looked up, and then we were able to move into a small flat in the village of Tetsworth in Oxfordshire. So, um, moving straight along, um, I'm going to pass forward to now, or well, kind of not now, but 40 years ago or so. Um, between 1969 and 1970, um, I moved from Kent, which is where Diane mentioned, and I got a job at Phil Black, which was a carbon black factory. I don't know if you know about carbon black in Avermouth, terrible place, black soot all over in the fields, and in fact, the local farmer was given given money to compensate for his milk, which was destroyed by this black, this black powder. Um, but the money was good, and I was doing continental shifts, which is a terrible shift system. And I was living in Richmond Road in Montpellier, and. Uh, I was a member of Bristol IS at the time. International but, Socialist. Right. <laughs> and now the SWP, but quite different. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I was given the label by certain individuals there as being a hippie worker uh, because I had long hair and a beard, and I was very much into the burgeoning counterculture at that time, um, which certainly went against the grain of many what we called straight left organisations. Um, we felt, I think, the politics of everyday life was very important. It wasn't just about spouting about who did what, when, Trotsky, blah, 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 but how you lived your life, how you related to each other as men to women, women to women, men to men. That was the ideal. We wanted to live, if we could, in a more communal way. So at that point, I did actually get, I couldn't stand working at Phil Black anymore. So I was lucky enough to get a job at the Bristol Eye Hospital as a, as a theatre supporter. And I met my partner at the time. She was a student nurse. And we were living in Cowper Road up in, in Clifton. And she used to laugh because Cowper is actually, I, th I think, Cowper glands or something. <laughs> It's, it's like a biological reference there, so she thought Cowper was a funny name to call a road. But it was in the bedsit, and we resigned from our jobs because in 1972 we got a chance to move into a big house along with some other people and to live more communally. And this was 10 Watley Road up in Clifton. And as I say, I was getting more and more kind of orientated towards, I suppose you call libertarian socialism, other people call anarchism. So that was my political motivation. Um, and actually, Ten Watley Road was owned by a Maoist couple who actually had a Maoist bookshop in Old Market. And they were paying mortgage for the place. And as far as they were concerned, we all look kind of hippie-ish. <laughs> But they were concerned with getting a regular rent, obviously, to cover their mortgage. So we, we moved in, and at that point, the first real squats, as far as we knew, started off in August of 72, um, in, in at Eleven Park Place, which were sort of a group of kind of Georgian, I think, houses. And up there would be a copy of the squatter's handbook at the time, which we used as a reference, you know, which described exactly how you would squat and how you'd open up a house and connect the electricity. And it was owned by an outfit called Land and General Development. And unfortunately, 
So people have moved in next door that were into heavy drugs and they were starting to thieve off each other, etc., etc. So the problem was getting dire. So they were very happy to know that we'd moved into 10 Watley Road and they were into living more communally. So they, these three people, um, Jenny, Kirk and Jerry, moved in with us to get away from those unfortunate situation that's going on in the squats. Um, so we started to use the base as a meeting place for Bristol Claimants, thank you, Bristol Claimants Union. Uh, we had a duplicator, which was very important back in that, those days, because you couldn't crank out a leaflet, really, autonomously, without a duplicator. It's probably like prehistoric in a, some museum somewhere, you know. But it, we, it worked as best as it could ever work. And we also built a, a, a screen pr a printer, which was a um, basic printing outfit for doing posters. And we had regular meetings there, and we also, um, and there would be up here a copy of it, <coughs> Bristol Street Press, which was something that we tried to get out on a monthly basis, which covered all the things that were going on in Bristol politically, and contributions from various people, and squatting and where we had meetings and everything else. So we put 10 Watley Road as our contact address. Um, so, um, actually we took our um, artwork for the magazine up to Islington in London because there was a squat up there that actually had an offset litho printing press and those were massive machines. And the point of them, them were, I mean, I just wanted to sort of illustrate how uh, organized it was. Groups from all over the country would come to Islington to learn how to print their magazines and their propaganda at this squat. And they, the people who ran the squat idea was to train people to be able to use the printing press without their technological input. And if I'd have been trained, I would have been able to have put up this wonderful <laughs> PowerPoint here. But, um, so it was, it, it was dynamic in that sense. Um, anyway, one day, uh, a real, an official looking guy with a suit and a briefcase banged on the door of 10 Watley Road. And it turned out he was from the bank and he had a possession order, a repossession order, because the Maoist couple that owned the place had stopped paying their mortgage. Apparently they didn't like, they, they were okay with it being used, you know, by a group of whoever, as long as they were paying the rent, but they weren't <coughs> happy with politically suspect people running, you know, their organization, if you like, from their house. So they would rather just let the house go so they could get us out, because we were paying the rent, so legally, we were okay. So we were a bit ticked off about that, in fact. And actually, we came down here and confronted them at their bookshop. Uh, but, and, and the last things I remember them saying to us was, when our party gets into power, people like you will be up against the wall. <laughs> they didn't add mf -er, but anyway. So, um, you know, we knew where we stood there. Um, so, at that point, we decided, because we had our friends, brothers and sisters from the squats, who were very interested in squatting and carrying on a squatting campaign in Bristol. So, a section of us opened up a squat at 20 Ashley Road in St. Paul's. And actually, it was pretty hairy, because in those days, the cops couldn't throw you out if you had the lock on the door. Once you actually had a lock on the door and a key, am I right, Arthur? Is Arthur, uh, you know, te Arthur was there. He's, he was in the advice centre, St Paul's advice centre, running it. Um, and we just got the lock, you know, we <laughs> trying to get the lock on, and the cops arrived. They were pushing against the door, you know. It was like, shh, 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 you know, Ooh, you know. And luckily, they didn't get in, we got the lock on the door, we had the keys to the place. And with the 
Spotter's Handbook, we, 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 we learned how to really like do more things with the house, etc., etc. So that became our new um, replacement to Ten Watley Road. That was our, our action centre, sometimes in action centre, because you know we enjoyed ourselves too. It wasn't all boring politics. Um, so we organised our squatting campaign from there. So gradually, other squats were opened up at Ashley Road in the same block, Belton Road in Eastern, Normandy, Normanby Road, I think that's in Eastern, Bannerman Road, and Rosebury Terrace in Clifton. So then, I think about, about there, we decided that we would call ourselves Bristol Squatters Association. And at that point, I really wish I could show you this, but... I should have been here earlier. Um, we, uh, one of our Scots family was, a group of people were disallowed their electricity, uh, even though they didn't owe any money, they had a contract all set up, but because they were squatting, uh, the SWEB, the Southwest Electricity Board people, wanted to make a precedent here of not connecting squatters with power, and that way you know, it was discriminatory because actually I think by law, as I remember, everyone was um, entitled to electricity, gas and to the services, as long as you didn't owe them money. And um, so we occupied the Sweb offices uh, with about 50 people um, and it lasted five hours and the police came and Eventually we were evicted from the premises and they arrested me and uh, then anyway at that time we were holding Bristol Squatters Association meetings at the St Paul's Advice Centre at 146 Grosvenor Road. At this point um, I, I hope we can get the actual documentary, 18 minute documentary of the camp, it, it mentioned the campaign. It focuses focused around Jenny Ross, who was a single woman with three kids, and her sister. Um, and it was done by um, BBC West at the time. It's a bit rough. The actual condition of the original video that this DVD was taken of was already kind of not in good condition, but the actual sound is very, very sharp and very good, and visually it, it says a lot, and there's a, also it shows a meeting of the Bristol Squatters Association too. So I'm not sure if we can set that up. I think the projector is uh, not working. Oh, oh no! <laughs> might, might be the bulb. Oh, okay. But the, the, the uh, technician is coming. Okay, so, so you know, yeah. It's coming in the wild. It was having a Excellent. problem. Excellent. Yeah. So Great. I'll just pause at the moment. Quick. We can't do it. Um, but you could, you could hear the sound. Track. Yeah, the, we can play the sound. Why not? <laughs> Is that all right with everybody? I know we're a visual society these days, but. Imagine you're listening to the BBC, and it's a great, it's a very good um, soundtrack. And I'll sit down. It's called the Lawbreakers, by the way, which was guaranteed to sort of get people to watch it. I suppose you know the Lawbreakers. It's quite a label, really, isn't it? Um, okay. It, and let me just quickly mention Jenny Ross, Rose Hickory, Jenny Williams, Councillor Bill Graves. You'll hear him being interviewed. He's, if you could see him, you'd see he was in a hot seat because he was the head of the Labour Council at the time. And he got, he's the one with the tie. If you see. Right. And the sweat sort of breaking out like Richard Nixon used to like sweat, you know. And he's got a ciggy on as well because in those days you could smoke cigarettes everywhere. Um, okay, so there are different. Ah, okay, the law. Okay. Oh, wow. Wow. What's this? Oh, there we go. Uh, this one? 
This one? No, Story Hill Hidden. No, that doesn't recognize it. That does not yours. That, that can't this, be yours. This, this is yours. Yeah. Okay, so maybe you should. Is that the whole video there? Just while he's do, doing that, it's quite interesting that BBC West made this film about the squatters back yeah. in 72. Yeah. And the, 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 the January films. this it's year, Bristol Radical uh, History Group was in oh, on BBC got, West I've, again sure on one of our recent DVD projects. Play. So it's you can sometimes machine, dismiss you know? the bourgeois <laughs> media, <laughs> but so they can be quite useful in terms of making films. We'll, we'll give us a couple uh, of minutes to see if it goes, otherwise yeah. Matt will have to take over from speaking again. We do have someone coming down to have a look at the projector. We fear the bulb might have gone, which should be... There's excellent. a light I can see from here. There is a little something in there. Yeah, I mean, I there's a little... Yeah. It's searching. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I can see it. Yeah. I can see it. Yeah. Right. See, it's the so light. I'm wondering. I'm just hoping it finds what it's looking for. <laughs> the only other way to do it, to get the sound, I would think. Yeah. 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 That's monitor. Is that a computer? That's a computer, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was, it was working. We, we were here at half past ten. We got it all set up. It was working fine. Um, when Marilyn was talking, we put the, um, the projector screen up, mm. pulled it back down again, and it stops working. Ah. It'll be right in the night. <laughs> Allegedly. Is there anything more that you would have said after the film? Perhaps you could be doing that while okay. we're um, Yeah. So, uh, in April, in April 73, uh, the police, in the shape of, I think it was the regional crime squad, and probably uh, special branch, raided uh, a couple of IS people and a couple of Maoists uh, on a fact-finding mission. Um, they just took away some address books, etc., etc., and that caused a ripple, I think, through the left in Bristol at that time, as you can imagine. Um, but then, they in September of the same year, my partner and I, we were hitching down the road from Ashley Road to go, go to London. I think we were off to London. And, as we were like walking along the road, on the other side of the road, a car drew up, two cars drew up, three cars drew up, and the cops, who were obviously cops, I suppose, they were kicking down the door of our, our squat, and another car pulled up and pulled us in, and we said, what's going on? Let's see your ID and, if, you know, get all that old stuff. And they reversed and took us to the ride well, as it was then, and we there were, we spent about 25 hours in the cells. The, the weird thing about it was we could see shoes outside a row of cell doors, and you know I recognised some of the shoes. You know I thought, oh my goodness, they got other people here that we know. We're not the only ones. I mean, we didn't really know what the heck was going on, and um, yeah, you know the lights were on all night. Uh, I was pulled out along with my brother there and, uh, and sisters. Um, we were questioned uh, all through the night, and it, it became clear that they were attempting to link us with two other people who had taken it upon themselves to firebomb the Portuguese consulate, which at the time Portugal had a fascist dictatorship. And the warrant that they raided us under was under the Explosives Act. And so it became clear by the way they were questioning, they had photos of me on demos, they knew a lot about where I'd been, but I, they couldn't really establish a link because, you know, conspiracy, if you put conspiracy onto something, right, Bob, back then particularly, then, then they can throw away the book if you're found guilty. It, it, there's no limit to the amount of time that you can do with, in jail, right? And so it was pretty freaky, you know. I mean, the interesting thing was that it's reality, reality time. You know, you know about the system. You know, you, you all agree that, you know, it's oppressive. But when you actually, as you all know, one way or another, you know, it, it really did throw us through a wobbler right there. Not only that, they took everything in the house, every, every scrap of paper, garbage, from the garbage and all our 
everything we owned. Uh, they took, they cleared the house out, and uh, anyway, we weren't, we we weren't allowed legal uh, to get in contact with anybody. The whole thing was obviously they were out. We felt to get us at the time. Anyway, uh, and, and just to throw in, there was a mother and her baby who was part part of this whole raid. Um, she was held for six hours, but you know she was denied nappies for, for her child and food for herself or the child. So anyway, um, we went to the Trades Council who undertook an inquiry and I do have a copy of the Guardian report on that inquiry and actually Wedgwood, so, um, Anthony Wedgwood Ben was part of, you know, he, he, he asked a question in the house I believe about it. Um, but at least we got it out there into the public domain, otherwise no one would have known about it except us. And we went back to the squad, but as you can imagine, um, it wasn't a great, great place to be, you know, we were a bit paranoid, you know, we didn't know if they'd bugged the place or not. And we had to go back to the police station where they had every item itemised on a list, and. We had to check it off as we filled our bags up and took away, you know. We even had to come down with a van for our furniture and everything. So, in effect, we were... In effect, our operation, if you like, or our group operation was, was shut down. Uh, because we couldn't really live there effectively anymore after that. It just didn't feel that we felt we were targeted. The good thing was that other squats were still going, and we, uh, you know, gave support to them as much as we could. But we kind of split up, and some of us moved out of Bristol altogether. Because when I was this, as an addition, I was arrested at, at this web offices, and I was um, I, I had to undergo like three days of a trial and uh, Bob was my represent one of my representations at the time, right Bob? And, you know, we had handbooks on everything, you know, like how to do this and that and the other. It was very well organized and there was a handbook on how to defend yourself in court. And it was very important because um, defending yourself in court and speaking directly to a jury, because it was a jury trial and it's your life, and it's your, you know, you, you actually have some control over the situation, you know. And luckily, I spoke to the jury at the end, and I actually dismissed Bob and and my and the um, counsel and uh, carried on the trial, you know, speaking on my behalf. And luckily, I got off both, both, uh, both, um, whatever. Thank you. And then. I met with my legal representation and he said, uh, police aren't very pleased about this, uh, as you can imagine. And you're not thinking of going on sort of long-term holiday, are you? I said, it's funny you should say that. And so I, I moved to London and got involved with squatting, etc. In fact, I moved into the squat that had the printing press there and became part of their collective. And I believe down in Bristol, what morphed along the line was housing associations. So, in a sense, you know, the re it was a good reform our squatting campaign led to, if you like, housing associations, but it did help people like Jenny Ross and to have affordable housing. So, and also, I think the important thing was for me was that people took direct action when they felt powerless to begin with, you know, you're a mother or a parent with kids on your own struggling, and then you actually part of a group uh, and you take action, um, it empo it's empowering even though you find, you know, you, you learn other things about it. And so I felt very much that things were achieved and uh, we also had fun while we were doing it because, hey, what's life about if it isn't fun too? I'm just looking at the technical yeah. team to see, oh, whether, uh, do we have lift off, do you think? Um, so. 
like the computer's not working, but I figured a way around it. Like we can put it in the back of the DVD player, and um, so if if I could sort of stand across and maybe stand on one of the chairs, I'll slide it in, and we'll Thank see. Thank you, Matt. The sound won't be so good, but it will do. Okay, so while that's going on, and if people are taking cover from being stood on, then let's get some. Well, that was going on questions and comments is it okay to do that questions yeah fine yeah questions and comments at this point on the yeah, yeah well, one thing i'd say i mean this is health and safety um in about a year or so later there was a housing action campaign which involved squatting an office block in the center of bristol and a lot of different groups came together who hadn't known each other very well and a huge amount of political activity took a, took place as a result of squatting that, that, um, that office in Victoria Street. Just, uh, what's, the, what's the road that goes across from Victoria Street across the river? Portwood? No, Bristol no. Bridge. 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 No, br down from Bristol Bridge, Bridge towards, um, towards Temple Meads. There's a turning on the left where there's traffic lights. Temple Bow. Oh, yeah, just opposite there, there there's an there's a, there's a office block on the corner and that, <coughs> that office block was taken over. And for about a week it was occupied. Um, and, and that led to a big campaign that the Evening Post took up, front page coverage day after day, in terms of uh, um, houses, not offices. Yeah, and, and I mean, that came out of what you're talking about. It was the next stage in, 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 a, in a movement in, in Bristol around housing and squatting. And I imagine that people here who are involved, oh no, it's not technique, but also the people are here who are involved in squatting today, you might want to talk about that. Yeah. The other thing I remember, Mark, I don't know if you can clarify this, was where the watershed is now, all that block was going to be demolished, wasn't it? It yeah. was squatted, W shed it was called, I think. Yes, yes. That was squatted and it was saved. Yeah. If it hadn't been for the Squatters Association, that would just be yeah. rubble. Is, is that right? I, I believe I so. I mean, I, I did that. that. You know, I, my memory, as I say, is a bit hazy on things. Yeah, but exactly. Yeah, yeah, it was all going to be demolished, wasn't it? The whole yes, lot. yes, yeah. indeed. And you know, I think, and, and Arthur saying about how it continued on was really a, a positive outcome from our small campaign. You know, over those couple of years or so. Um, so the, the remote control is also broken. So I can stand <laughs> on top wow. of the chair. Is that a sabotage? He's going to stand at the whole time. Well, no, no. Hopefully not. But, um, um, I, do you know if... Is it the first... Is it just it, the first bit of the DVD? Well, or is actually, it, there's three... Three sections. Yeah, uh, not of that particular one. There's right. three different videos. Okay, okay, all right. Well, I'll load it up and maybe you could guide me through it. Sure, um, sure. Um, Let me... But meanwhile, uh, other, people, other points they want to make? I'm just uh, hoping nobody's smoking any, th having any thoughts about anarchist organisation at this point. The, the lack of a bureaucracy that's made us make decisions about technology. Of course, the term libertarian has now been morphed in the States to mean something rather different. Mm. Uh, I guess there's right, right-wing libertarians and left-wing libertarians. We never hear much about uh, I, that. I'm inclined to think, given the time, that actually we'd be better off having a, a general discussion if we're not going to get, you know, otherwise we'd spend the whole time fighting the technology, and then the two o'clock uh, people will stop coming in. So, so uh, would people like to make any comments or ask Mac any questions, or Mac or the other comrades from that time, any questions about the squatting in the 70s? Right. Yeah. You mentioned Easton and Clifton. Was that that in St Paul's a little bit? Were they all the main areas for it in that area? Like mm -hmm. pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was more than one squat in some of those roads, um, and there were evictions, very quick evictions, and then re-squatting again. So it's sort of an ongoing yeah. thing. Yeah. We, you know. We were only a small group ourselves, so we, we, we had our time cut out for us, so we did as, you know, helped, supported as many people as we could in those different areas. And then, then it became, there was students got involved and, and something called student community housing became a negotiation with 
property owners of empty properties so that they could take over so-called legal squats. Yeah? And that, that, that then took off on in different parts of Bristol, you know, including the top of St Michael's Hill and around that area, uh -huh. and up towards Blackboy Hill. And, yeah? well, what we did was we got access by some sympathetic people on the city council who were part of the Tribune group uh -huh. to scheduled list of empty properties. So we could find properties that had, you know, four and six Durden Park up on the downs. They were waiting to be done up for tutorial rooms, but the money wasn't there. So you knew they weren't going to be used. So getting through the coal hole, occupy, and then ask for a license. No good asking for a license if you're not in there already. No. Um, if you do that, you're as likely to get the council to smash up the toilets. Yes. Do the roof in. So direct action and yes. deal with the bureaucracy. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. in your in your video, which you may not see, there's a lot of stuff about, and I remember that time, councils used to go and smash the toilet bowls yeah. in properties so people couldn't live in them. Yeah. 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 The thing about the student aspect, um, we turned it into sort of Bristol community. Now. It wasn't just students, although we did um, squat buildings that were now the physics department up in Clifton. They were long term. But um, it was a mix of students and non-students because there was a big student housing crisis. But um, there's an infamous president of the student union who was called Trevor Locke, who negotiated with the university, so-called on our behalf, that all the non-students would move out. <laughs> yeah? I wasn't a student, I had a little kid. Quite, you know, um, in the end that happened. Yeah. So it's discriminatory. Well, I mean, what we were saying was, look, students coming, yeah. use up the rented accommodation. Come on. Yeah. But he negotiated on our behalf without telling us. Oh. First thing we knew was the bailiffs. Yeah. Yeah, that's May he rest in. <laughs> who, who was he? Who was he? Yes. He was the president of the student union at the time, if I remember right. Where he is now. So did he have any link with you? Or was it just. We'd, we'd had loads of. Um, in order. For part of our campaigning and all that, I think we got a grant from Student Action or something like that, 15 quid for mailing and stuff. And then um, we'd. Um, oh, run the plumbing bill, getting some houses sorted out for living in. And the Student Union agreed to pay it, but then some legal board stepped in and said, no, it was ultra virus, you can't have the money. So we'd had lots of links with the university. But no, he'd got no. He wasn't a member of our outfit. We wouldn't fight him. Any other questions or points you want to make? Was it all mostly explicitly political, or was it actually people just needed somewhere to live? It was absolutely not explicitly political, except that you could say any, any action is, you know, political in that sense. But uh, certainly not, because, you know, no, no one, this was, the, the basic issue was homelessness and the right to have a roof over your head, and to be autonomous within that situation, you know. Um, and I was just really talking about our group motivation, our politics at that time. Um, so no, it wasn't explicitly political. In the sense that squatters and homeless people weren't saying, we are members of whatever, you know. I would say, to use a cliche, you know, grassroots, working class people, particularly single mothers who had the most hardest time. There are real parallels with the E15 mothers group mm -hmm. in London now, uh, the, the kind of mm. campaigning against homelessness and the whole kind of ways in which things uh, things are very similar, though of course the law against squatting has worsened since that time, which actually wasn't illegal if you didn't damage uh, the property to, to get into, you went through the coal hole or an open window. It was actually legal. Well, one of the provocations was just how many streets there were of boarded up houses. Yes. Um, and, and it was obvious that that was what was going on. You know, where the M32 is now, there was just street upon street of boarded up houses. And houses being knocked down rather than being done up. And people were 
you know, that was in your face. At the same time, so many people were homeless. So there was a, a kind of political issue there, yeah, which is what this grew out of in, in some ways. You know? I was just going to say, um, given what Max said about being um, picked up by the police, there clearly were attempts to link to political issues, even if... I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I was just saying, with you being picked up by the police, there clearly was an attempt by the police to link it to political action. You said that they tried to make uh, you link to this group that had lobbied or uh, demonstrated in the, in the Portuguese embassy. Mm. So, in a sense, although you weren't saying that you were actively political in that sense, mm -hmm. the police who didn't like the fact that you were spotting and were right. trying to make links that weren't linked. Yeah, the police certainly were no friends of homeless people no. or squatters, absolutely. Mm. absolutely. Yeah, and I mean, in that sense, you know, in that sense it was a double whammy when they shut us down, you know, mm. under the auspices of something else. You know, mm. they couldn't let shut us down for squatting, but they... We're trying to do it because it's overt and political. Yeah. <coughs> the political police, mm. yes. It would be interesting to find out what has happened to all those people and all the squads. And I think that the St Paul's riots changed a lot. So again, that bit, uh, I think the St Paul's riots were uh, a bit of a turning point. Because for a while there was no, for about 24 hours, there was no law and a lot of people looted, the police were scared, but then they came back very, very heavily, and it all changed. So that's just after that period, isn't it? Yes, mm. yes, 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 I actually saw it, yeah. There's four or five years difference. Yes, but it, it, it was all over that period, wasn't it, building up? I, I, well, there was always clashes in mm. St Paul's with the police, yes, absolutely. Yes. But there were no... Quite recently. Yeah, during that time there, were, there wasn't a riot then, you know, not in the, not between 72 and 74. No, I'm trying to oh. say that was a very crucial time. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it marked a, quite an extreme change. Yeah. Didn't they come up with sort of a facility for the youth after the, that riot? Where, well, they, some they, sort of, they uh, poured reforms? money into St Paul's. So that That's they, after 19 So there were about four... Yeah major community centres, yeah. so money was poured in uh -huh. and it was just a question of stopping their mouths with cash, really. Uh, we, we are as soon as we can get to the In case this doesn't work, is there other way that can, this can on internet or something? Can it be? Found? Maybe, uh, maybe uh, uh, Ivan. Maybe yes. will we be able to put this disc onto YouTube without it having been shown? Of course you can. You've got yes. the original. Yeah, yeah, that would be very great. So we can see yeah, we'll it somehow. Through, through mm. the yeah, I mean, it's seen by it could be seen oh, by someone. Wow. Well. <laughs> um, so what are we looking for here? Well, it might be hit and miss here. I mean, this is a weird configuration here. I'm not sure what these mean. There are four other, four other videos on it. And it might be... Try to, ah, that was a good... Wait a second. It flashed on. Oh, no, different. But this is working now. This is working. I don't know where the sound is, but... Um, hang on. Uh, but this isn't. But that's not the right one. This isn't the right one. But if we can get volume next, that's great. Okay, so I've got a next button. No, not that one. Sorry about that. This one? No, not this one. We're getting there though. That we got sound. Not this one. 
This is all Brooklyn. Um, ah, there we go. But it's the beginning. This is. This is. Uh, uh, yeah, we need to rewind on it. Forward from here, that's Yes. Ah, so you're doing it like that. Yeah, that's the only ah. that looks like I've got through this. Okay, keep going. Not him. <laughs> yeah, a bit quicker. We're getting close, like all slow now. Okay. Oh, uh, it's not. This goes on and on. No. It's the six hour epic. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot on bicycles. Yeah, it's about bicycles, yeah. But it's in Brock well, in, in uh, New York, so it doesn't really relate to Bristol in that sense, although traffic. <laughs> God, it's back on there again. My goodness, he's got a lot to say. <laughs> Is it worth me skipping another chapter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay well, we're in the squat. Let's, let's go with that for the moment. Pardon? So I take it back from here? Yes. But we're okay. running out of time. Okay. So we need to go now. Yeah. Oh, back from here. Uh, play now. Let's play now. <laughs> Okay, we've, right. so we've missed Council Bill uh, Graves, but well, this is a squatters meeting. The while they, were the, the, they finally admitted that he was probably the prolific. And um, then once they got most of the stuff out, they started boarding the place up. Um, they smashed the sink and the loo in. And then um, they got us by the arms and uh, ejected us from the house, carrying the last few things that were in there. They, they said they were there to keep, keep the peace. Um, well, is, is it not true, Jenny, that last week the clerk of Bristol Corporation and the clerk to the High Court in London were notified in writing that you had vacated the property and in fact an official from Bristol Corporation Education Department came and visited you at your present house, which is two, two streets away from Belton Road? Yeah. So they were fully aware of the fact that you were no longer resident in that house. Yeah. There's another thing. They they didn't they didn't show me the eviction order until they got in. They didn't give the 24 hours notice. And once they did show me the eviction order, it didn't have anything to do with me on it at all. The police eventually admitted that forcible entry was a criminal offence, but they weren't prepared to do anything about it in this particular instance. Councillor Graves' quote that they said was, if we let Jenny Ross get away with squatting, others will do it. And if that happens to the vanity, where will we be then? <laughs> we keep coming back to this basic um, problem for homeless people. The housing department can't meet the demand of the houses, as we've agreed at the moment. And then um, there isn't enough temporary accommodation. What can they do if they're in that situation? I mean, isn't squatting anything they can do? They still come to the housing department, they still come to social services. And as I say, we're taking pretty drastic steps to try and alleviate this problem. It all comes down at the end of the day to a stock of housing. It's still... In the meantime, in the meantime, tomorrow, today, if someone's about to become homeless, all your temporary accommodation units are full. The housing department obviously can't give them a house. What well, are they going to breakfast situation tonight for them until we can get ourselves sorted out tomorrow or the day after or the day after? We're constantly having to buy time. Buying time is precisely what squatting does for the homeless. Rose Hickory and Jenny Williams both squatted in the same area of Easton as Jenny Ross before moving into this council-owned temporary accommodation at Minor Road where they pay rent just as they would in a council house. Both believe that they would never have got temporary accommodation from the council if they hadn't squatted first. Rose was living in a lorry with her children in Bristol in March 1972, unable to afford the rent for a private house and waiting for a council house from Bristol Corporation. I didn't want to take them to care. Um, and this was the only thing Bristol kept coming up with. You know, well, we'll take the children, we'll put them in care. You'll have to fend for yourself, you know. So you moved then into an empty house? Into an empty, empty house, yes. Yeah. We stayed there for six to six days until on the third time of trying, they eventually did get us home. Only on the understanding that they housed them temporarily and that put us back on the Unlike Rose, Jenny Williams wasn't actually on the streets, but she was pregnant 
and living in conditions which were very bad indeed. So you finally decided to move out. And what did you do then? We moved into the It's um, already done up, ready for somebody. Council workmen came round and then um, I wouldn't let them in. So they went away and got some officials. And they came back and uh, stopped telling me about you know, it. was the worst thing I could have done. And they said uh, they contact social services. It was uh, social services got me into here. Do you think that if you hadn't squatted in the house, you'd have ever got even temporary contact? No, I really don't. So do you think that for anyone who's either homeless or living in conditions of squalor, the only way to bring pressure to their services to give them temporary accommodation is to squat? More or less, or camp out on college street. <laughs> Squatting is usually on one level a straightforward response to a desperate situation, but it's also a method of exerting pressure on the authorities, the Bristol Squatters Association. The wider implications of it is that not only is it squatters or and homeless families that are fighting back by squatting, because they've had to, they've been forced into that position, but it's just part of the general scene where people are fighting for a decent wage, they're fighting on rent levels, going rent strike, and this is why I think we must, as a Scots Association, link up with all the other struggles in Bristol, uh, and nationally as well. Um, and because we're all fighting the same battle, I think, you know, we can learn a lot from what has happened in London. Scots are linked up with trade unionists, and the trade unionists who have been sent, like building workers who have been sent, to help evict people, to cut off electricity or to cut off the gas, have, because of the link-up, refused to do it. Yeah, I mean, the thing we must do is try and approach the general public, though, because general public, they, they seem very ignorant of the facts. They just think it's long-haired people squatting, trying to live on, you know, live on the state in a free home. And they just don't realise what homelessness means. This is the argument that the Town Park used. At this this so-called uh, summit meeting, and when he, he played the heavy reactionary, he said that uh, you're talking about getting community support. Do you honestly think the majority of Bristol support you? He said, of course they don't. It's only a few, and he's right. It's only a few. It's only a few. Take bother to find out. But if we can get them to know, if we can get them to take an interest, then we will get the support, and then. We can use all the so-called democratic methods yeah. to stuff them, to show them exactly what they are doing, and to yeah. get a change. Yeah. But there is no political will on the part of our society to provide every family and every single person with a home. Well, if everybody had a home, then there wouldn't be the question of houses and house prices would drop, and the middle class would get upset about it. Yes. <laughs> and if you're the and if there weren't empty houses, it would be impossible to squat. People only squat because there are empty houses. And in Bristol, there are at least 2,000 empty houses, 300 of them owned by the local authority. This is shelter, by the way. This is a shelter representative. The efforts of the squatters to publicise the shortcomings of the local authority shouldn't be necessary. The legal machinery to compel the authority to meet its obligations already exists. Until this year, none of it had ever been used. Then, in March, Shelter asked the Supplementary Benefits Commission to make use of Section 25 of the 1948 Act to direct the Bristol Local Authority to provide temporary accommodation for the Stockford family after they'd been homeless for two weeks. When the Commission refused to do so, the Stockfords, with Shelter's assistance, went to the High Court in London. The case was not proceeded with further because the local authority then reversed its original decision and moved the Stockfords into this temporary accommodation at Cliffs Road. Councillor Graves claims that this would have been done anyway without a threat of further court action. Shelter and the Stockfords are sceptical. What the whole exercise does make clear is, firstly, that the machinery to enforce the law exists and secondly, that the authorities are reluctant to use it, one department against another. In the meantime, the main burden of providing homes for the homeless falls on voluntary bodies like Shelter and the Squatters Association. As long as it continues to do so, we can expect squatting on an ever-increasing scale.
I've been suggesting to shelter situation, they often form themselves into a housing association. But why should it be a voluntary organization which provides the letter when it's the housing department and the social services department? You have the legal obligation to deal with this problem. Why, why should you push it off onto a voluntary organization? Are we pushing it off onto a voluntary organization? I wouldn't suggest that we are, because in the same way as voluntary organizations are helping us with our elderly and our handicapped, why shouldn't they help with our, hous our, our housing? <coughs> there are housing associations, there is legislation, this perfectly legal thing for housing associations to be formed. Why should it always be the local authority? I've always believed in cooperation between voluntary organizations and the local authority, because the local authority at the end of the day can never carry out all its obligations. <laughs> it, it would be better, in some ways, if the situation for homelessness was on an entirely different level. We're going to um, need to stop one organization set up to, right just to deal with this mm -hmm. situation. Because the only people that are homeless are the lower pay, pay brackets. You know, I mean, the wealthier people of the country never come up against this situation. And therefore, it's only the, the people in my own situation that really know what, they, what they've got to face up to uh, and exactly how difficult it can be. Minute. Okay. Oh, pause. Pause. Okay. Literally a minute. To, yeah. Just as a wound up. Yeah. Um, in a sense, I'm I'm more amazed at, at the guts that of, of a lot of families. I mean, I you know I try and sort of put myself in their place sometimes, and I just could not put up for one moment um, with the the tramping and the turning away and the sending from this office to that office to that office and the phoning and the telephone boxes, you know, all this sort of, of, of confusion um, I would find so utterly depressing. And yet, as I say, they, they do doggedly go on. And I admire the families for this enormously, but I mean, one must also not blink the fact that families do split up. Um, I, do, I actually think the whole we do need to close unfortunately because the next group is waiting outside. Anyway, so but if you could just please like, put it on internet or something. Sorry, if you could put it on the internet or something. We could put it on the internet. Yes. So you look in the graph of the radical yeah, we'll history site. It'll be on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. You'll be able to see. It. So I'm sorry it was fragmented, but I actually you, got you. all the stuff that it was going to say, but in a kind of odd order. <laughs> <laughs> we apologise for the technical stuff.